Hey there. Hope that you're enjoying the podcast and our take on the Curse of Strahd. We would just like to let you know that we will soon also start playing the adventure Terroticum for Cult Divinity Lost as a Patreon exclusive campaign. And we would currently like to invite all our Patreon supporters to be part of creating a few aspects of the story, starting with two important NPCs as well as what weapons the main characters would use if they should end up in a violent situation. If you would like, we would be happy to invite you as well to join us in this process. Head over to Patreon and back us at the $5 level to join in. Hope to hear from you soon, but for now, enjoy this episode of Curse of Strahd. What is all this supposed to mean? A bunch of cards... I've never been to a reading like this before. She's trying to set us on a path. The question is, is is that the path that I would want to follow? Finding some sort of blade. A powerful blade. A blade with which to kill the devil. An avenging blade. But whose vengeance exactly? Hardly someone I would want to become a servant of, even if it were the king of the nine hells himself. I'm drunk. I'm confused. And the only company I have is a sulking priest who doesn't seem to know how to enjoy himself. Me and the Vistani, we should throw him in the river and then drink wine until the sky turns red. If that is all this world has to offer, then so be it. This is Red Moon Role Playing. The night. It's becoming later now as you leave Madam Eva's tent. Roman, you already left, but you notice that Roshek left a few minutes after you. Still, you're now both outside the tent in this camp. The Vistani seem to be slowly stopping their festivities. They're still drinking, but they're now mostly just talking quietly among themselves. Roshek, eyes are still upon you. Everyone is watching, but they're trying to be passive about it. I, uh, kind of lost my lust for drinking right now. Starting to feel rather a bit more tired, but also a bit apprehensive because I'm wondering what she meant about what will happen after midnight on the road. I'm standing outside the tent. I'm looking towards the fire, letting the... The flames sort of hypnotize me as I as I think about the words that Madame Eva said and I'm trying to make sense of them, but but I can't. They're just they're like a riddle. And it's a riddle that I'm not gonna solve tonight. I uh, cross my arms and I look into the flames as well. And I <clears throat> clear my throat and I say Did you uh, Did you ever Kill someone that didn't deserve it. No. No, I can't say that I have. But this place... I don't know. I don't know what this place will do to us. I hope we can stay strong and... Not become like this place. Not become like... Like those other people we've met. (laughs) Do you remember earlier today when... When there was this, uh... There was this gallows, and and you went up to look at them, and then you came back because you've seen 
seen a ghost and then and I trail off and I look as I lost my thoughts and my lust in it. I continue staring at uh, at the fire. The the thoughts of what I saw there they do come back, but I I do my very best to suppress it. I'm mildly successful. Well, shall we shall we call it a night? We have more traveling to be done in the morning and uh, I suppose it would be good if Irina and Ismark aren't left all alone in that cart. It is, you know, not exactly the safest place even though I do trust that these Vistani will, will, will keep the perimeter. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. You know... After you left, she told me that there might be some sort of spectacle on the road at midnight, so I thought I might stay and see that before hitting the sack. Huh, a spectacle, you say? How much longer till midnight would I mm, approximate? You suppose it's probably only another hour away? Well, perhaps, mm, perhaps it will calm my nerves a little bit. Perhaps it will... Yes, make me forget some of the things that I experienced today. Hmm. Perhaps it will have the opposite effect, but it does sound intriguing. Shall we wait for it, friend? Yeah, let's watch the fire die and uh, and see what happens. Normally I would have uh, probably gone off to find a nice female to flirt with and who could braid my hair, so to speak. But now I am not in the mood. I don't say this, but I just think it to myself. Isabella saunters over to you as it seems most of the Stani are retiring for the evening. Well, when I say retiring, I mean going to their own wagons to drink inside. She seems to have overheard your conversation, though, as she comments. You want to see a spectacle on the road, do you? I'd go back to your wagon and look from there. You should just about see the old Slavic road from here if you look back a little where you came, yes? <laughs> it's quite a spectacle. All right. Well, thank you for the hospitality. I'll see you in the morning. I nod to her and uh, start moving towards the wagon. You make your way back to the wagon, still parked a little bit on the actual dirt road that seemed to veer off from the main road you were on before. From here, though, you do notice that it's easy to see a little part of the road you came from, about 10, 20 minutes away. What do you do? I start heading back to the wagon. Yes, and uh, reaching uh, the wagon, I sort of try to see if uh, either Ismark or Irina are still up. You do not see Ismark, but you do see Irina. She's sitting with the horses on the little riding perch. She notices you approach. Been having an enjoyable night? Well, it's been something. Mm, they seem... They seem like a harmless bunch. I think we made the right choice into coming here. Are you keeping guard? Hmm. I suppose. I can't sleep. So is Mark is having some rest. They won't trouble us, I don't feel, but they are not a harmless bunch. But best not to cross them. But my brother, like many, mistrusts maybe too easily. But he does have reason. After all, most of them are servants of the devil. Is that a fact? Do they, uh, do, they do something to you, then? They have never done anything to me. But did you not wonder why they can come and go as they please? Or maybe you didn't know that. Hmm. Well, it was, after all, one of them who brought us here in the first place, for all we know. Yes, I have been reflecting upon the fact that they do seem to be the only ones truly enjoying this place. Hmm. What do you mean by coming and going? They can go past the mists. It's been so for hundreds of years. They bring things from the outside world back to us. Many mistrust them, but I've always felt that without them, 
we'd have even less than we have now. Pass the mist. Is that what you call it when you go back to the... Well, where we're from. Yes. The mists that lie on the borders of Barovia. You didn't try recrossing them, did you? Interesting. You wouldn't have been able to, you see. No, um... We were... Actually, we got kind of disoriented when guessing here because of them. That is natural. Was, I think, one of the... She she made some sort of session with us, the old lady. She showed us a few cards that's supposed to mean stuff, and one of them was was the card symbolizing mist. Maybe that was what she was talking about then. Irina shrugs a little before remarking, I would not know, although they say some Vistani have the gift of prophecy. Again, I'd be on the ones in the village. I have not really interacted with them. I uh, go over to... Pet my horse, and I grunt a little, and I make sure he's all right. Yes. There is, uh, supposed to be some kind of spectacle on the road at midnight. The Vistani, hmm, well, they were talking about it. Would you have any idea what they're referring to? Irina winces a little, and nods. I would hardly call it a spectacle, but it is something that happens every night. It has happened every night as long as I have lived. You are welcome to view it, I suppose. It won't be long now. I, um, I sit down next to her if there is room, and I wait the spectacle to come. You wait for some time, the minutes slowly moving on, the night cold and dark. The fires around the Vistani camp are slowly dying down, and you can't help but feel that beyond them, darkness is... All around you, filled with eyes and noises. Eventually, though, you do notice something. In the dark of the night, you start to see some sort of light coming from the road. Although, of course, you are a good distance away from the actual road itself. About a 20-30 minute journey. But you can still see from here this light Well, I say light because it's more of a luminescence, a sort of glowing blue something seems to be appearing upon the road. Roshek, you can see better than Roman. You look ahead. There are people on the road. Multiple people moving in a procession of some kind. It's still a bit hard to see, though, from here. What do you do? I stand up and I squint, looking over at them, and uh, then I uh, turn to Roman and say, I'm gonna go have a look at this. Are you sure that that's a good idea, friend? Uh, Shouldn't we wait here? I think this is important somehow. I think it's somehow connected to the wizard and what he tried to do so long ago. Well, I suppose it would be safer if both of us uh, went, rather than just one of us. Would you mind if I accompanied you? I shrug, and I swing up on my horse. Are any of the horses uh, untied, and so that I can sit up on it, or uh, shall I walk? You feel you could walk. Uh, I imagine Roshek is only moving forward a little on his horse. He's not galloping all the way there, or are you? That's exactly, yeah. No, I'm moving at a fairly slow pace, anyway. Roshek mounts his horse and begins to slowly ride off, just a little, you know, just moving down the road a little, to get a better view. Roman, you follow, and five minutes along, you can get a much better view. It also seems that what you're witnessing materialises more solid. It is a procession of men, warriors, priests, travelling folk. There seem to be a myriad of different people, actually. Yes, they are all marching up the road, and yet they are all translucent, see-through. These people, Roman, they are dead, and yet they are marching before you, Ten, twenty, thirty, forty. It is continuing to go on for quite some time, it seems, as you watch. What is this? 
What kind of sorcery is behind this? I just look at it. Procession moves on. It seems to continue for at least five minutes. Ten minutes. Again, multiple people, all carrying weapons or spell books or packs. They march on, their expressions miserable, solemn, upset. What do you do? I uh, look down to Roman and I say, they're probably going off now to try and fight the, the devil in his castle. Yes, I suppose that is what they do now. They repeat the same journey every night. Is that what they meant with with this with this always happening? I don't know. I don't know if we can talk to them or anything. But I wonder if the wizard is in there somewhere among them. Maybe he'd know something that could help us. I mean, if they're even receptive yeah would you like to give it a shot I say and smile a little knowing just how dangerous of a thing it is that we are talking about leaving the camp further behind than approaching translucent dead things oh that doesn't sound particularly safe but hmm, there's something about it that is also a bit exciting I don't think they want to harm us I don't think that's what they're after. You begin moving closer, although you notice as you get closer your horse starts to resist a little. He doesn't like getting closer to this spectacle. You also notice as you start getting closer and closer the details. The faces. They shift in and out from looking perhaps once as they did in life to being skeletal, reanimated ghosts. What do you do? Uh, I uh, try to call my horse and uh, reel him in. He calms, he knows you, but he doesn't want to get closer if, unless you order him to. Yeah, and I'm particularly, I don't really like the idea of getting closer on my feet either. So I hesitate for a bit as I watch them. They do not seem to notice you. They continue. You must have seen at least a hundred by now. Maybe even a hundred and fifty. So many of them. Yes. So many. All dead. Hmm. Well, maybe this isn't so helpful after all. Maybe... I don't know. I don't know how we get any of them to tell us a story. I, uh... Despite saying this, I dismount my horse and... uh, I tell him to go back to the camp... Then I start moving up to the procession. He starts to move back to the camp eagerly. You, on the other hand, walk closer and closer, seeing more of these figures, haggard, their flags broken, aged, their swords speckled in blood and rust. The closer you get, the more decomposed and miserable these people look. And yes, it still seems to be going. It looks like... Looks like they're in the shape of having faced him already. Yes, it does not seem as if they were successful, does it? I look around trying to trying to see the wizard where he would be in all this. You were not given a description. So you look, I suppose, for anything who looks wizard like, and there are certainly individuals in robes carrying staffs, but it's hard to tell one person apart, especially now as they all just seem like decomposing skeletons. I'm more like looking for a leader of the whole thing, of the procession. If there was, it passed long ago. There is no ranking, it seems. Everyone marches in a single 4x4 four four formation. Some of them dressed in resplendent clothing, others as paupers. It doesn't seem to matter. I stop and I, I shout out, Hey! See if I get a response. No response. Huh. Hmm. What do you say? The night is late. How about we head back before we end up before we end up joining this procession? I I don't particularly feel like marching tonight. No, I I don't know. Maybe it was a foolish idea. Ah, 
Never mind. I kick the ground and I start heading back. What a strange place, I think to myself as we start to move back. The thing that unsettles you, Roman, when you think about it. You are familiar with restless dead and the ghosts of those who have yet to be put to rest. But this number, how could priests of Lafander, paladins of Lafander, how could this be allowed? These souls should be at peace. This many. What is going on here? Yes. But things are different here. I saw that firsthand at the church. Yes, Lathander's power is weak here. And that is why things like this are allowed to continue. You both make your way back to the horse and cart. Irina is still up, watching. She nods. So, what did you think? I, uh... I shrug, and I seem a bit uneased by the whole thing. Uh, I uh, look at Roman. Quite an army, isn't it? They say those are the spirits of every single person who has, she looks at you, Roshek, come to fight the devil. He makes them walk the road every night. He has done so for years and years and years. I suppose as a reminder of what happens to those who try and face him. Well, having seen this, I I feel at least a bit better about knowing what it was that they referred to with this spectacle. And, and seeing it with my own eyes and, and seeing that, yes, it is something strange. It is translucent living dead, but it is it is just that there isn't anything really unknown about it from what I could see. It is it is what it is. There is logic in this world as well. It brings me some comfort. And I uh, had to uh, lie my head down in the cart and try to get some sleep. I, on the other hand, feel more unease now. I don't... I didn't really realize how many actually went to attack this thing and how many were killed and are now being kept endlessly in this loop. I'm starting to feel a bit disheartened about the whole idea of going to fight whatever he is. But uh, I don't say anything about it. I just sulk for a bit, remain a bit quiet and... (laughs) I uh, remove my armor and wrap myself up in in a cloak. Irina nods at you. She is silent for the rest of the night. A scarf she has around her neck she fidgets with for a moment. And she just remarks to you, I can't sleep, but you should. Do not worry, I will breath soon. Fine. And I'm tired from the wine, from the dancing, from all the impressions, and I... Just lay my head down and probably doze off. And I mumble prayers to Lathander until sleep comes to me. And sleep comes to you. Indeed, you will both be having a long rest before morning. Roman, your sleep is troubled. You dream of pyres, burning stakes. You dream of a voice. A voice you know. This is an old dream, though, not a new dream. He always wonders where you were, why you weren't there. Roshek, you have a different dream. You recall the dream you had before, the dreams you've been having a lot lately, of strange voices making you question your path. You do not dream this tonight, no. You dream a dream of something beyond you, something... In the light, it has a commanding and confident voice. It is not the voice from before. It is different now, stronger, more precise. Roshek, you will find your way. Roshek, your time is coming, Roshek. Roshek, stay this course. Find the sword. You will find your destiny. And the sword. We found a sword. Who are you? Who are you? Who's there? 
The dream fades away as quick as it came on, but the rest of the night you sleep surprisingly well, and you both awaken in the morning to find Ismark up and about getting the horses ready. Irina finally now seems to have taken some moment to have some sleep. What do you do? It is morning, again, as morning as it ever is in this place. Well, I uh, go out and I see if the camp is still there. The camp is indeed still there, although you notice no signs of any activity. No one is out to greet you or say goodbye or say hello. The wagons all look locked up. I get up and uh, I conduct the, the prayers of first light, of, of greeting, greeting the morning. And it feels good. It feels so good to perform this, this ritual, this routine. Things are still the same, yes. Yes, things are still the same. We're just far away from home, that's all. Do I remember my dream? Yes, you do. Huh. I go out to the side of the road and I have a good long piss. And I think of this dream. <sighs> yeah, right. The sword, that's what she said as well. Chrome sword. Yes. The sword. And you notice, as you think of the dream, you feel very confident about it. More confident than you felt for weeks, months even. Almost, it's hard to put a thing on it, but you almost feel a little like you used to before, well, before you even decided to move on from your previous colleagues. Huh. Yeah, that feels good. I go back to, uh, to the rest of you and uh, I start finding something to eat. And get my things on and ready. Ismark throws both of you some rations before looking around the camp. He remarks to you, I hope you two got what you wanted. Maybe it wasn't so bad resting here, but we must go now. Any more and they all demand payment of some kind. I don't think they want us here anymore anyway. Agreed, I say. Agreed. Let us continue. We have things to do. You must get your sister to safety. I grunt a bit and I um, eat the rations and... Uh, then I uh, say, yeah, better get out while it's early. Ismark nods and gets the horses ready, and if you are all ready, he will begin the wagon moving away from the camp. Yes. It's time. I uh, get up on the back and I start playing the drums again. Hmm, humming to myself, focusing. And so you begin once more on your journey, following this dirt road away from this pool and back into the thick woods. Time passes. Eventually, you come to a point before a great waterfall seeming to fall down into the river that then becomes that pool you were at moments ago. Above you, you notice the natural incline of the area leads upwards. There's a bridge leading over this waterfall. And to your left, a road going back into the woods Ismark mentions that this is now the way you must go to get up to that bridge. The road becomes more twisting and turning, but you can feel you are rising up in altitude. And after an hour or two, you actually come to this part where this bridge now leads over this waterfall area. As we go along, I am telling stories about weapons and things that I've had, about a crossbow that I used to love. And how it's got broken from this and that, and I had to fix this back and this and that. And uh, more and more stories about this and that. Ismark is amused by your stories. He seems happy for the conversation. You come to this bridge leading over this chasm. You notice this bridge has gargoyles cloaked in black moss perched on the corners of the bridge. Their frowns were worn. On the mountainous side of the bridge, that waterfall now spills into a misty pool nearly a thousand feet below. You can see where you just were a few hours ago. You have now ridden up the incline through the forest. You, Roshik, have a good sense of geography. You'd say that obviously this waterfall, and then the river you're now looking at down below, eventually leads back to that pool and the camp where you were. And you begin riding over this bridge. Roman, what are you doing in the back? It's been a few hours now, travel. Yes, I, um, 
I have been thinking, I have been praying, I have I have been practicing the the words required for for some of the the spells that I hope that I won't have to use, but that I have prepared just all the same. And I hope that Lathander will continue to answer my prayers when the time comes. Things have been so so calm, so peaceful after after all that violence, I just, I just hope it will stay this way. I think to myself as, as I sit there in the cart and, yes, and, and watch the landscape move. You ride across this bridge with no events occurring. As you cross, Ismark mentions to you, Roshik, at the front. Ah, the surf falls. I have not seen them for a very long time. Still, we are getting closer now. If we keep good travel, we hopefully shall arrive at Valakai just as night falls. Hmm. I uh, draw in the air. What's it like here? Is it fresh and outdoorsy? Compared to the air you have breathed in before, lower in the valley, you suppose. Yes, this is fresher air. You are higher up. You are now level with the mountains that perhaps you once saw back in the village. And a few more hours pass as you travel along this newer region, the forest seeming further away. This region is very hilly, mountainous. Eventually, you come across a little crossroads, again on this road, one part of it leading onwards, and another veering off a little to the east. You see a sign at this road. The sign heading northwards says Valakai. The sign heading eastwards says Castle Ravenloft. Ismark frowns a little as he looks to this road. Looking down it for a moment, you see far, far, far down this road. Yes, the fortress you saw before in Barovia, only now much closer, and yet still far, still probably a few hours away. But yes, you see it now. Huh. I sit and... Uh eat something and I look at the fortress. It is imposing, mighty. So this is where the road forks then? Ismark nods and ushers the horses on to speed up. He quickly starts speeding away from that crossroads heading north. Yes, let us move as quickly as we can. At least we have daylight hours. Uh, I'd not like being this close. Huh. Are you... Have you ever heard a, a tale of a sword of some sort? I uh, keep on talking about weaponry, but uh, now leading it into our current experiences. His mark shakes his head. I know of swords. You are speaking of a sword in particular? Well, the just the old... The old lady that told our fortune yesterday, she she was talking about finding a sword. And then I dreamed about it as well. I imagine you have had your mind clouded by Vistani. You probably are going to see a sword in a shop, and she has made it sound far more dramatic for Silver to pass her hands. I would be careful of how much you believe of what Vistani say. They are nothing but trouble. I nod at this. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. And you continue. Again, hours pass, leaving behind this area. You then come to a point where the road goes through another massive pair of gates, very similar to the ones you came in through. The walls here are not quite as spanning. Here, this gateway seems built just into the sort of in-between part of two mountainous areas. And again, you ride past these old sentinels and a gate that seems open as you go through and closes as you leave. Ismark breathes a little sigh of relief and remarks, For now at least we are out of his direct surveillance, although all these lands are his. That part is his primary domain. Hmm. Hmm. I'm starting to... Yeah. I'm obsessed with weapons today, apparently. And I'm starting to talk about the conjured weapon that Roman brings forth, and I'm trying to coax him into conjuring it up so I can see it and touch it. 
Hmm, friend, this is this is not the time. We should we should save it for when it's needed. Yes, it has been of great use to us so far. But what does it do? I mean, what if uh, can you can you like hand it over? Can I use it? Can if, I mean can can I if I hold it, will I be able to swing it? How does it work? I think that one day we will find the answer to that question. But I do not think that this is that day. Hmm. The journey continues for four more hours as you descend now back into the valleys and forests of this domain. You see before you for a while, before you start truly descending, more forest, and also to the northeast of where you are, what looks like a massive lake. It's hard to see many details, that mist is always prevalent, but in these daytime hours you can see much, although you notice now the hour is slowly getting later and later, and evening will be approaching soon. What do you do over these next three or four hours? The darkness approaching makes me feel uh, uneasy. I uh, try to keep a good lookout, try to make sure that nothing sneaks up on us. I I heard Ismark say that these lands are supposed to be safer, but darkness just, yeah, just makes me feel uneasy. You can't help but feel this entire time that you are being watched, that even though everything has seemed peaceful and quiet, it's the peace and quiet of a grave. And in these woods, as you descend further in, yes, you feel it too, Roshek. There are things waiting for you. Waiting for you the second you leave the road. You feel if you were to venture into this forest for a moment or two, you would be consumed by whatever lives within. That's an unsettling thought. I, uh... <sighs> Stop playing for a bit as we go into these forests and this isn't closing on us. I don't like that. I preferred it up in the mountains or the hills. I look around for any signs of activity or perhaps even the raven that I spotted earlier. Yes, you see a raven on a tree branch. In fact, you're pretty sure you've seen it twice now. Over the hours, that is. Hmm. I make a comment about this. Is that raven? I saw it yesterday as well. It's been following us. I, uh, look at this raven. Do I see it as well? When you look, you see a bunch of ravens then fly up from some woods nearby. Hmm. There's quite a few of them, aren't there? They're usually not birds that move in such big packs, right? Aren't they mostly solitary? I don't know, but this one, this is one of them. Ismark laughs a little at this. My friends, I think you are seeing things. One raven, ten ravens, there are ravens everywhere in these lands. Some of them are his spies, some are just ravens. Still, you should be always careful not to harm a raven. They say they carry the souls of the dead. Not that I believe that. I remember this now, and that's... Someone told us that before as well. And, uh... I, uh... I sort of still wish I had a longbow, even if I wouldn't want to shoot it. And I start talking about a longbow that I had once. I was really good at shooting ravens. No, I didn't shoot ravens, but shooting birds and game. Do you ever... Do you like hunting, Roman? I have enjoyed it on occasion, uh, especially in my youth, but uh, I haven't done it for quite a while. Other things have, have occupied me. Studies, yes. Those things that priests do, right? Do you prefer using a bow or a crossbow? If I can pick, the crossbow is more to my liking, but they're uh, fine weapons, both of them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like crossbows. I like bows, too. Hmm. And uh, I take up my uh, the crossbow that I have in my uh, connected to my pack. I haven't seen any use thus far, but uh, perhaps, perhaps one day, hand it over to to Roshik. I uh, 
extend my arms if I wanted to examine it, and I start tinkering with it and looking around. Yeah, this is not bad. What did you, what have you shot with it? Hmm, targets. Um, target practice, primarily. It's, uh, this is something that uh, I have kept around as a memory. I uh, look down and aim out into the forest, look down the sides of it. Hmm. Yeah. Should be able to pick off a raven or two if I wanted to with this. But let's not. No, let's not. I take it back. It belonged to my son. You have a son? Yeah, I, I, I have a son. Oh. Where is he? He's with Lathander now. He's at peace. And inside my head I just think, at least I hope he's at peace, but I really don't think so. I nod for a bit, thoughtful. I see. Was he, uh, was he, uh, was he training to be a priest like you? Or was he a priest like you? No, no, he was, he was, I don't think he had quite the patience for this line of work, but, uh, he did, uh, he did like some of the stories. He did like hearing about Lathander. Uh, I miss... I miss telling him stories. Ismark seems pleased with the progress you're making on this journey, he remarks to the pair of you. It's the hour is growing late, but hopefully just a few more hours and we shall be there. At this stage of the journey, you have now descended fully. No more views. You are now deep within forest again, this old paving road leading you through. To the east of where you are now, you can see this lake sort of like massive lake spanning for quite a while. Is that sort of, uh, I mean, from the road scene? I mean, is it through the forest or is it along the road? You, some time ago, veered off straight west then, and now going westwards into the forest, you can now see this lake to your eastern side. After another hour, though, darkness does start to descend, perhaps a little quicker than you were expecting. Mist picks up heavy on the road, and you start not being able to see very well on the sides of the road. Ismark looks a little concerned, but remarks, This is the final stretch of the journey. This way for another hour or two, and we should arrive at the gates of Alakai. Mm. Good, good. I can't wait to get to get out of this darkness, and, and hopefully into some place with a little bit of light, even if it is only candlelight. Roshek, roll me a perception check. Let's see. Thirteen. You look into the darkness now surrounding you on both sides, and you think you see movement, but it's hard to tell. This darkness is starting to cloud your vision, even with your dark vision. I take out my longsword from my side, and I keep it at the ready, and I mutter, Yeah, I think uh, things in this forest are eager for us to stop or get lost. Ismark frowns at this. Irina, by this point, has also woken up. She's looking outside the windows of the carriage. She seems distracted. What is... what is out there? Do you know? I ask her. Something... something is coming. He... something is... she seems... to be muttering a little to herself. A low growl now fills the air. Multiple growls coming from both sides of you. The sounds of beasts. And then the carriage draws to a halt as Ismark pulls up the horses for a moment. Ah, curses. Curses! You can now clearly see, Roshek, out of the darkness, right in front of you, the shape of wolves. Behind you as well, all sides, in fact. They've suddenly emerged from the darkness. But these are no ordinary wolves. You know wolves. These are bigger. Their backs more hunched. Dire wolves. You can see at least ten now. Surrounding you. But not moving. Okay. I'm trying to 
uh, read what's going on here if if I think they're going to attack if, or if, if this is some other ploy. I tried to read the animals somehow or get a grip on it. You are skilled in animal handling. You don't need to roll. They're waiting. They're not moving. In fact, it occurs to you that if they were going to attack, they'd be attacking right now. Ismark looks to you. Okay. On the count of five, I will spur the horses on and we'll try and ride straight through them. If we make a good progress, then maybe you can, we can get through them quickly. The town is not far. What do you say? Are you ready? Yes, I think they're trying to stall us. They don't want to attack us. They're waiting for something. We might be able to get through, but they're moving probably faster than us. Ismark looks concerned but nods. He starts to get ready to do his plan. And then he stops. Roshek, a figure, is approaching you on the road. A figure on a horse, cloaked, tall. It's coming towards you. The wolves, the dire wolves, are holding fast. What do you do? I, I say to Roman, maybe you should get that crossbow ready. And I uh, peer at the figure. Yes, I do just that. I hope it will not be necessary, though. Perhaps, perhaps we should talk. Yes, talk. Talk is good. Is Mark swears a little under his breath, but he nods to the both of you. Damn it. I suppose we must wait. This isn't a good... No, this is bad. This is very bad. The figure comes forward a little more, right up to the front of your carriage. It pulls back its hood, revealing a man with long, dark hair and elven features. He regards you. Hail, friend, I I say to him. We are travelling to Valakai. We hope to make it there before night falls. Who might you be? The figure looks at you for a moment in an assessive manner. He snorts dismissively and then looks to the carriage. He seems to be not paying much attention to what you said, Roman, as he remarks, Lady Irina, my master wishes to give his condolences for the loss of your father. He knows this must be a difficult time for you. Therefore, he is willing to give you some time of mourning, a few more days. He will then be coming for you. I hope there will be no complications in this matter. Irina, at this point, comes to the front of the carriage, anger on her expression. I do not know who you are, but I will be dead before I go anywhere with your master. Tell him that, will you? Ismark reaches for his blade. What do you two do? I see Ismark here reaching for his blade, and I, I try to sort of to, to calm him down to steady. No, 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 don't. Let's not. Not now, okay? Not now. The figure seems amused by this sudden show of force. Ismark nods at you and puts his blade away. Irina remains silent. Now, now. There's no need for force. We are going to let you go. As I said, my master wishes for Irina to have some time to mourn. And then he will come for her. Quite simple, really. What does he want with her? I say. He looks over to you, Roshek. He sneers a little, an expression of disgust on his face as he looks at you. I do not feel I need to answer you, beast. But I suppose no harm. Irina is his. He shall be claiming her. Simple, no? Hmm. Beast. You're the one who walks with beasts. Hmm. <laughs> he laughs a little to himself. These are natural beasts. Your kind, Orc, are the scourge of this world. Even worse, half-breeds such as yourself. You care to say that to my face? He smiles at this. Yes, I do. You are a half-breed cur, and your parents should have killed you at birth. Well, you knife-haired, stinking mongrel. You come down from your big horse and we'll settle this right now. The wolves around you start to growl, and... Roshek, could you roll me another perception check, please? You too, Roman. 
Nine. Eighteen. Roshik, you do not hear anything other than the growls. You are far too angry at this individual. But Roman, there's something on the air. The sound of... People. Voices. Voices in pain. Voices screaming in horror. It's very faint, though. This figure takes a few more steps forward on his horse, and it gets louder. The figure comes straight up to the carriage on his horse, and suddenly all of you can hear this discordant sound, this wailing, misery, sounds of women, sounds of men, crying in pain, agony. It's almost now all around you. The figure smiles. Oh, beast. It would give me no greater pleasure than to add you to the list of many who have fallen before my blade. But that is not my master's wish. Although, of course, I will defend myself. Please. Please do make me defend myself, beast. Hmm. I try to... Try to call myself a little just to get a grip on how powerful this being is. You see before you're a fighter. He's got a weapon at his side. He knows how to use it. Far more disturbing, though, is this sound. It's getting louder. Almost distracting. It seems to become louder as he's come towards the pair of you. Ismark looks a little distressed. Irina is shrinking back into the wagon. Roman, what do you make of this? These sounds, they are horrible. The sounds of people dying. Fear. This is horrible. We need to end this. He has delivered his message. Surely now it is time for him to return to his master. So I speak up and I say, Now, now, we, uh, we don't need to have anything exciting happening here tonight. You have delivered your message to Lady Irina, and uh, your work here is done now. We will move on, and there will be no trouble, right? The figure looks towards you. He nods. He turns to Irina, though. Although, of course, if you wish to come with us now, it would make things so much more simple. Do you wish to come with us now, Irina? Irina brings out the weapon she has on her person and holds it to this figure. You will have to make me come. You will have to make me. I would rather die. And then suddenly a weird look comes across her. She's now looking beyond this figure, into the darkness right in front of you. She drops the sword. She falls silent. I look at her, and I look back to the figure, and I look at her. And I say, you go back to your master, you pitiful servants of this abominational thing. I would have respect for my master when he is within hearing range. Beast. And he looks to Irina, and then looks behind him. Roshik, roll me a perception check with advantage as you look beyond with the dark vision. Fourteen. You can't make out clear details, but... But no, there is something... There is another figure. It's further away, behind the wolves, watching you. You feel a chill on the back of your neck. This elf looks behind him and looks to Irina for a moment. And Irina seems to suddenly snap back to her senses. (sighs) She shivers and just retreats back into the wagon. No. He wishes to give you more time. Very well. Oh. You are told to enjoy the festival. It should be quite entertaining, I believe. And he starts to ride back to the wolves. And the wolves start to slink away. And, Roshek, you thought you saw something ahead, but it is definitely gone now. Hmm. And you are left in silence. Once again on the dark road. I, uh, I sheathed my blade and I turned to Ismark. What was that about? Why was he, why does he want your sister? Mm. His mark seems very upset. He has immediately started spurring the horses on. I don't know. I don't understand. He could have... Why did he... Why have they not... What does he mean? He has no respect for anything. Why did they not attack? I don't understand. That makes no sense. Irina, are you okay? Irina is silent at the back of the carriage. She seems very upset. Roman, what are you doing? It's a game. Don't you see? He's playing a game. He's torturing you. Both of you. That's the only explanation I can think of. As Mark starts to ride the carriage on, and you move with great haste into the night.
You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the campaign Curse of Strahd for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Curse of Strahd was designed by Christopher Perkins and based on the adventure Ravenloft, written by Tracy and Laura Hickman in 1983. Dungeons & Dragons is published by Wizards of the Coast. The music is created by Metatron Omega, Flowers for Body Snatchers, and Word Clock, and is used with permission from their label Cryochamber. Visit cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more tasty dark ambient. A new episode of Redmoon Roleplaying is released every Friday. Please like our Facebook page and give us feedback, comments, and input there. You can also visit us at redmoonroleplaying.com. Finally, a huge thank you to our growing base of supporters. You are truly amazing and inspire us so much to keep going with the show. If you haven't yet found us on Patreon, please have a look at the links in the description and see if you want to show your appreciation and encourage our work with the show there. While the show will always be free of charge to our listeners, Patreon supporters have access to extra material such as our bonus Q&A podcast, Ask for the Moon, where we discuss all topics and questions our Patreons have for us. You can even get access to the full-length, raw and unedited versions of our gaming sessions way before they are released as finished episodes. Thank you for listening. Looking forward to meeting again next week.